G'day everyone. Today we're getting the roof ready to do the blasting and priming on the inside of it. So naturally there's going to be a few different finishes. We'll have a weld through primer across here for doing our spot weld type welds in here. And we'll put the weld through primer in here that we can use with the MIG welder in there. Now a lot of people are using the copper finish ones for everything but I've done a few experiments and it does actually melt with the heat of a MIG welder and it will actually blister up around it. So I'm preferring to stick with the grey zinc type primers for my MIG welding and just use the copper finish one for the spot welds. Now I've learned in the past that the zinc type primers give you a very poor spot weld when you're doing it with a resistance welder and they break very easily. So the copper one works best there but you really just need a thin coat because spot welds work best with no material in between them at all. But a build up of paint in there will contaminate those welds. It will make them weaker than what they should be. So the first job today is to get rid of all this old proof coat. Now car manufacturers back in the day use just a one pack proof coat. So if we put a solvent on here, it will melt. And they put it in the roofs to actually stop drumming noises in the roof and also cut down on a bit of the heat coming through. But this product's had its day, it's 50 years old. The roof is starting to rust underneath it. It's delaminating in places. Some of it will be stuck on there really tight. I'm gonna to have to work a bit to get it off. And I want to get it off before I start blasting because any amount of extra work we put into a roof skin or a quarter panel or something like that with the blaster, we run the risk of distorting it and creating problems with it. So if I can scrape all this off here, it's just gonna be a light liquid, the blaster, to get rid of any of this surface type rust that it's got and get rid of any remaining little bits and pieces of this and then we can clean the whole thing up and prep it to go on the car. We can see there's a lot of rust underneath it just in this outside edge and it's where this condensation's been in the roof and caused problems. Now some areas back here where the proof coat was actually covered really well but it's got rust has crept in behind it and quite often where you'll get even just a little tiny crack in it or a split in it moisture gets in there and it'll just run its way across the steel with capillary action and we've got all these little rust areas that need addressing and left unchecked they will rust through the panel. got all our proof coat off. There's a few patches where there's a bit of rust growing underneath it and it's sort of spread all over the place so it is best that we have taken it off and it's pretty old technology stuff. Today there's a lot better material out there on the market and some of them are a spray onable sort of proof coat but you can get them now with little ceramic spheres in them which will cut down the heat a fair bit. The actual fact that you've got anything up there will stop some of the drumming that will come through the roof and even the the adhesive dynamat type stuff where you've got an adhesive layer of a black sticky with a silver paper over the top of it, that'll work really well in these applications too. Now, particularly with a ute, in this era, we have got headliners suspended by steel bows and the headlining material has got a little calico loop stitched to the back of it, which slides across the bow and with nothing on the roof, that will chafe on the steel in the roof and cut the calico through. And so if the car gets used, and I'm saying like 100,000 miles sort of stuff, you will wear through that, it will drop down, and then you're up for more repairs. So it just wants something put in there. It could be a piece of underfelt, one of these special proof coats, or a bit of dynamat, any of them will work. What I want to share with you now is a thing that's happened in the past to this, and I've found it when I was repairing the back of it. So I've told you before, I have replaced this piece of the window opening at the back and I have welded it about halfway down this face all the way across. I've also said before that it had previously been repaired and I've undone the old repair and replaced it with new steel. Now, when they were repairing it, they've blown a hole through into rusty metal, both sides, there's a big patch over there and a big patch here, and the repairer has chosen 
to just get there with a MIG welder and zap, zap, zap and build a piece of metal to fill the hole in. Now, the repair was right on the edge of where the window rubber went and on this side, he sat there and created a piece of steel that goes all the way up to the corner on the back of the roof. That's really a situation where you'd be better off to cut your losses if it's starting to explode and not being able to be welded and just cut the whole section out and weld a new patch in. And this was quite porous. It had some body filler over it. So when I blasted it, you could see through it. And I could have cut the piece out, but I did sit there and did the same thing. But I will just tidy the inside of it up a bit and get rid of some of the lump of weld. But it is sound now. There's no holes all the way through it and things like that. So it will seal up and become a good repair. So it's this area in here, and you can just see where they've built it up with weld, and the same on the other side, and just sat there and kept welding and welding until the, the piece of rust was filled in with weld. If you've got a tiny little patch, and you've got to do two or three passes side by side, that's acceptable, but if you start walking up, and you like, look at this one, there's an inch and a quarter or so of steel that they've actually had to build that spot all the way up from the bottom, in those situations, you're better off to just cut your losses and cut the piece of steel out and weld a new bit in. And because it had been done that way, there was actually a distortion in the roof. And I noticed that when I first bought the car and had originally thought something in the back of the vehicle had clobbered the corner of the roof and caused the damage, but it just wasn't quite right. But once I cut into it and realized it was a heat distortion, everything made sense. So we'll tidy him up now. We'll give all this a blast and because I'm going to have to redo these weld throughs, I was hoping to preserve some of them. I could on this side, I could tape this and leave that there, but I'm going to have to redo that. This is going to have to go to the copper type, so I'm, that'll have to come off. So I've just decided I'm going to blast the whole thing and I'll flip it over and blast the top as well. And then I'll hang it up in the booth. And this side I'll do with the primer colored paint and I'll tape these sides so that I can come back and do them with weld through afterwards and the outside I'll do with epoxy primer so it's ready to start building up for our paint job. Here's our um, red-brown paint, so it looked like our red-brown red oxide primer. And I'm just giving a bit of a mix-up. This product's from Valspar. It's an industrial line of theirs. I bought it. It wasn't given to me. This is not a commercial for Valspar. This is a product I do like, though, for doing a lot of undercarriage -y sort of stuff and inside stuff. And being an industrial paint, it's made to take the hard knocks. So this is the sort of stuff they paint bulldozers and loaders and earth moving equipment with semi-trailers, truck chassis. So it's very durable, very hard, and it doesn't matter if we top coat it with an automotive paint, it'll work with that as well because it, it's a two-pack product. Once it's cured, it sets like anything else. So we'll give him a mix up. This one's a four to one to one mix, which means four parts paint to one part hardener and one part of reducer. And 
these mixing cups are the way to do it. Now we've only got to paint the inside of the roof with this, so we're not going to need a huge amount of paint. And with most paints, look at that, doesn't it look like red oxide primer? It's just good stuff, isn't it? Like all two packs, if you don't use it, you've got to tip it out, you can't put it back into the tin. Just want it like that. If we don't have enough, we're down to trying to paint with tiny little minuscule amounts to do the mix. So I tend to go with a little bit too much just so that I'm not trying to make a really odd bod mix to just finish off. And no harm in putting another coat on either. So if you've got too much left over and you've thrown the two coats on there, and something like this, I do if you put three or four on there. And all we're trying to do is just to preserve our vehicle. So we're sort of doing something the factory never did. And I've shown this little trick many, many, many years ago for getting paint out of a nearly full tin. And after a while you can almost work out in your head how much you've got in the pot. Save spilling it all over the sides. So that's our paint in there to the line. Here's another little thing for all you people at home that don't do a lot of painting, but you're using two packs. And every time you go to get your tin of hardener, you find that the lid has glued itself on because of the spilt hardener. Little bit of glad wrap doubled up across there, cling film, whatever you want to call it. And that will stop the lid from gluing itself to the hardener. And I have got hardeners I use all the time, and I'd say all the time as in every month that this works on. And I've got other hardeners that I might use once a year and it works on those too and the plastic doesn't actually react with the hardener or anything like that it'll just go back on there and if it's doubled up even if one line sort of half stuck on there it will allow you to get the lid off and then you can peel the plastic off the pot and that has just been a savior because before i came up with that i had plenty of lids that glued themselves on and you'd wind up destroying the tin to get the lid off because the little plastic neck that they're on isn't all that durable Reducer, of course, the lids always come off those. So now we just want 25% reducer, which is about that much. And give him a mix up. And we're ready to rock and roll. Here before. When two packs first sort of turned up and before these little disposable mixing pots turned up, we mix with dipsticks. And this is just an old early two pack dipstick that I've had for decades. But they make much better stirrers than they do paint measurers. Now here's another thing too. A lot of people get in here and do this and expect their paint to stir up, it doesn't work. You've got to lift the paint from the bottom to the top. It's an action with your wrist. And if you do it like that, you'll just quickly mix the paint all the way through. And it's a training thing. Once you've trained yourself to do it, you do it automatically. But the number of times I see people doing this, wonder why their paint isn't mixed very well. Yeah. I'm going to put this on the inside and I'm going to put an epoxy primer on the outside. So what I'm going to do is just mix up a gun full with this one in it and a gun full with the other one in it and then do them both at the same time. And that's my slops bucket with just a whole thinner in there that I clean things with. So that one is done. And we're gonna want now this spray gun doesn't work very well. And it's got a problem with the air diffuser for the fan adjustment on it. And sadly, SATA in their wisdom have discontinued all the parts, so you've got to move up to newer technology. It's not a real problem for primers. We can live with it like that. This one's a Glazerup product because that's what I do all my top coating in on the outside of the car with. I'm a system user, I'll use the same product all the way through and it doesn't matter what brand of paint you are using, I will recommend to anybody doing a one-off resto to use the same product all the way through. Now, let's face it, 
if you don't do a lot of this, there's a fair chance something could go wrong with the system. And the first thing the paint rep's gonna do when he looks at your car and he'll say, well, whose primers have you put under our paint? And you'll say, oh, that was Joe Blows from down the road. And they're gonna say, well, fella, you're on your own. But if you use the system all the way through, at least then the representatives from the company will know what they're dealing with. And if you've got an easy fix problem, they'll know how to handle it. So just bear that in mind. And like I say, it doesn't matter what product you're using, it's just the best way to do it. Now, I reuse these mixing cups until the numbers wear off them. They're originally designed for one or two uses, but the big problem you'll get is the paint going off in it while you're doing your spraying. So if you put the lid back on the paint tin, the paint doesn't go off. That's what we've just done there. Yeah, I've got a couple of other little jobs to do with epoxy, but I think the same amount will work. Now this level in this tin's gone down a bit, so it's easier to pour it than what it is to pump it out with the dipstick. And that much. It's same ratio for this one, it's a four to one to one. And up to the line. I can get two or three uses out of each bit of plastic usually and then I'll just throw them in the bin and grab another bit. And I've got a roll of it up here handy. See how quickly that lifts the paint up from the bottom through the hardener and the reducer. And when you first start off, you've just got reducer sitting on top, so it's really runny. But you'll see the product thickening up before your eyes. Now, with all two packs, there's not a lot of reducer in them. They are quite viscous, for want of a better word. And uh, so it comes down to the gun you're using, getting it all to work. I tend not to worry about straining out my primers. If you've got good product that gets used relatively quickly, you don't get lumps and bumps in the tin. And um, But for pretty much all your primers, if there's a little bit of rubbish in there, you're gonna sand it anyway, so it doesn't matter that much. But all the top coats, for sure, and clears, I strain all those through. And a base coat as well, that's being a top coat. So, we're about done. We'll get suited up and we can go and play in the booth. Ready to rock and roll.
Got our roof painted up and I was a bit excited about getting the colour on so I um, forgot to tell you this. This Velspar paint that I've done here in this red brown red oxide sort of colour is a direct metal top coat and there's two products side by side. One of them is called 540 which is a direct to metal glossy top coat and this one that we've used is called 543 and it's a low gloss top coat. Now it comes to the supplier with no colour in it. They just tint it to whatever you want. So you can make it any colour of the rainbow. I just chose to make it a primer colour just because it's a bit quirky and these cars had this overspray of primer everywhere inside them originally. And from here, we will put all our other things on there. So I'll use a modern type of coating on the inside here with this little ceramic content to it to cut the heat down that comes through into the car and that can be done with this assembled up on the roof of the car so we'll just get inside paint upwards that'll all be good i've got my various weld through primers around the edge and we're just about to put it together but this is the time where we've got to be super critical we've got to get everything super lined up all the way around the car and it's no good having the front corner on the driver's side looking perfect and you go around to the back corner on the passenger side and it's sort of cocked off on a little bit of an angle and the roof line sort of runs up at a weird thing and you go oh the driver's side's nice um, so we've got one go at getting this really good so we'll be a little bit fussy this time and get it positioned up really well before we start welding anything last time i had the roof on the car and when we were just sort of working on that back corner over there i noticed that these two front corners where it ran across the original pillar line where i cut it off were just a little bit flat they didn't quite have the same bulge in there now that's due to the bit of weld i've put in beside there has shrunk a bit and it's just dragged the metal in a bit so what i'm going to do now very quickly is just stretch these corners out now if you want to stretch something back it up with your dolly and you're banging straight on the dolly so that you're actually taking the piece of metal and you're actually pinching it between the hammer blow and the dolly and you're spreading it out so it won't need a lot we just need to hammer across our weld and just make it a little bit more material in there so that it actually sits up in line and if we happen to go too far we can just use the planishing hammer again tap 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 on the outside and we can just shrink it back down to the right shape but i don't think we'll go too far Now when I took this apart, the gutter's in two styles here. We've got this little piece of metal here that we've been working with all the time. And we're going to weld that back together by putting spots of weld, probably about two inches, 50 mils apart, right on this corner to the roof rail. And then they're the pieces we're going to grind away so that they're disguised. And we'll put the bead of sealant along there. This front section was one piece of metal which ran through and was welded flat to the roof rail in here. Now, for ease of removal, I've just cut that through here. So what we're going to have to do is do a butt weld upside down all the way through this area here, and then we'll grind that piece off smooth afterwards. Where we've got holes across these window openings, we're going to be plugging the holes back up, and where we've got new material that we've replaced, we will be doing resistance welds, spot welds on there across those. And so that's the two types of weld through primers. We've got this left corner over here where it wasn't rusted bad enough to do a repair, but there is a piece missing out of the front that was rusted away. Now, I'm not going to put it back in. All I'm going to do is run a little bit of a MIG weld across the rusted edge and bring that into that recess for the lead, and that will solve that problem. Where these holes are, we'll plug those just as we normally would with filling a drilled out spot weld. And Holden actually had a little MIG weld on the front edge of it where the piece came to anyway. So we'll just remove a little bit of weight from the car and it'll change nothing else. So I'll get it in position and then we will start lining it up.
the most important thing is we get these corners in the right spot. So this side's sitting a little bit low, and I've just undone that screw in there. Now we can belt this edge around here a little bit. This is a replaced piece of metal. We can stretch it and move it if we want to. What we really need is the original part of the car to be lined up nicely. And it seems to me that we're actually a little bit far back on the car. And it's probably to do with, once again, the back of the roof being replaced as well. So I'll get some screws pulled out and loosened in a few places. I'll get a clamp across here and I'll bump the roof around to make sure this corner is right. And then I'll probably get a little tack of weld on here to hold it and we'll get the other side right and we'll just work our way around making sure we've got all the corners in the right place before we get too serious with it all. Now we've got to come back to our cutting disc width in there and we've also got to get the gutter to line up. So at the moment the gutter's a bit low, side to side it's in a good position. So if I get a clamp in there and pull the roof forward because it does move when I pull the roof forward from the back. So if I can get that in there get that lined up and that won't help us because we can't weld it. That might work a bit better. Now it's always a case of trying things out and if they don't work be ready to reassess your plans and try and just get everything to line up. Bam. So I've got that Pretty good in there now, and pretty good there on the side. I might just wedge something in from the side here that I can just keep that levered up, and I'll get a spot of weld right in that corner. So, not that you guys can see much of this, but it's just a case of taking a little bit of time to get things where you want them before you start getting the red spanner out and gluing it on forever. It's having a little bit of trouble getting the roof to come far enough forward to close that gap up to the cutting wheel distance. Now I'm about twice as wide as I need to be at the moment and it's to do with the back corner where we've welded that in there. So I may have to just hammer this around a little bit in the back corner and just in this little area in here where the lead seam is to allow the roof to just shift forward and we are talking millimetre and a bit for the width of that cutting disc. So it's not a great deal, and we'd probably get away with it as long as the gutter line lined up. But we've gone to this much trouble, we might as well get it right. So I had thought I'd drop the roof on for the last time, but we may have to take it off a couple of times yet just to get this corner to sit where I want it to. So I'm trying a few things, and blocks of wood are always good things if you want to shift panels and just gently move them, and that way you won't cause any damage to the, the piece of metal that we want to salvage. And often if you've got your vice grip set just right and you want to jar something into a new location, it'll actually just walk through the jaws on the vice grip to hold it as you go. But we're not achieving much, we're still just that little bit too tight. So this corner sitting down right tight on the car. So I might even just split that corner to allow the piece of metal to bend out the way. And I think that's the way we'll go. Get it right now, or be forever grumpy with the look of the roof of your car. And I would be grumpy. I'd probably have to sell the car for nothing. And just like that, it all falls into place. Okay, now the best way I've found to get this all to work is if I hold it in place and I can get a spotter weld just up in this very top corner and that will get that stabilised there. I've got my roof gap pretty much where I want it. So if I can hold it there, I can work my way around to the other side and get the similar thing over there and then we come back and get these corners in place. But I want to just get it tacked and then we'll work out from that.
Right -o. Now this side's looking really nice. Everything's pretty much exactly where I want it with doing nothing. I've got a couple of screws in the back here still. So I can put a couple more tacks in that other side just to sort of stabilize that corner and know that I can still maneuver the roof enough to get these done when I come around this side. So I'm just aiming to get a bit of weld right in the middle of this arc. So by lifting up on the outside edge, I can spring the roof, get my spot of weld in there, and then I'll be able to push it back down and get the gutter back in line. The gutter alignment this way is really good and we just need to get that in and out movement so we don't have a dog leg in it when we come across that weld. But it's all going to work nicely. And once again, like everything, the more time you spend stuffing around with these little fiddly things, the better your project's going to wind up being. Now because I've got a gap there, I've got to have a couple of hits at it to get the weld to go on. And it's one of those times when welding by braille is not the best because you can't just sort of aim, shut your eyes and get a little zap there to hold it. So, a little bit fiddly, a little bit time consuming. This is why good restorations cost good money. So that has stabilised that line across there. Now we've got the gutters out a little bit. Now given that we have opened out that piece of metal behind it, we've blasted behind that, we've folded it back in again, it's no real surprise. But if I clamp it together with the vice grip, that will ensure the alignment. And we're a little bit out on the bottom still, even with that there. But I can give that a tap with the hammer and I can get a spot of weld just in that corner. Back of the roof is pretty close to where it needs to be. Looks like just pulling it down lines it up. Look at that. And we're joined. Look at that. That's pretty good. We know this piece that we made before has just got a clamp together, so we know that's in the right spot by putting a clamp on there. And the back corner has got a screw hole that lines up around the back, so we're pretty much on the money in there as well. So we might get around the other side and just get the same corner to the same stage over there, and then we'll start working the back of the roof. Got a little bit of a misalignment on the gutter, but it's just in the width of the little gutter where it pokes out from the roof. So that's because it's our opening up the inside and bending it back in again. We've caused an issue with it there. So what I've done is I've put a spot of weld right on the inside edge of it where it actually curls down off the roof skin and so comes to this point in the back. So that's in four or five millimetres from the outside edge, so three sixteenths to a quarter of an inch almost and the outside edge is just low. So what I'm going to do now is dig a hammer and I'll give that a good blow in the corner to just lift this outside edge up because this is where we've got that stitch weld through there with the two layers of metal, so it's quite rigid. And that has lined it up. So I can get a spot of weld now in the bottom corner and that will tie the gutter in place. So I might just hit that in a little bit. 
Yeah, that, that line's a rough straight across it now. This has got our front corner stabilised. And as I said before, this is the tiny bit where it was pulling a little bit flat across there. So when I had it screwed down and clamped down the other day, I did notice that we had this flat spot in there. I've stretched the weld out and that's just made it a little bit fiddly getting this corner back to where it should be. But we've got good gap on the gutter, good gap through there. So roughly cutting wheel disc across there. So providing we have got our windscreen opening at where we want it, so we should have 22 and 7 sixteenths across here and we have got 22 and 7 sixteenths and we should have 23 and an eighth to the top and we're on 23 and an eighth. So that's where that goes. So I might just put a spot of weld along this bit of the flange there just to stop it going anywhere. And we know that bit's in the right spot. Okay, that one done. Back is 14 and 9 sixteenths, which is what we should have. So same thing, I'll just clamp this together and put a spotter weld in there. Now if you're quickly putting these things together and you're looking for centre references, Easy on this car because there's a stud there for the tonneau covers in the middle and on most cars your interior light's going to be in the middle of the roof somewhere like utilities because they're at the back of the roof and on the front I was checking for the sun, not the sun visor, I was checking for the inside mirror where that mounts in the centre of the roof. So they're just quick and easy reference points that you can pick up for doing quick measurements and I'd say that's good enough. So a bit of weld on that one. that'll hold that in place. This is our easy alignment corner because you can see where I've drilled through into the inner panel by, with the end of the drill bit and it's just a matter of lining those up. So we can bump in, they line up really good to look at like that so they could be clamped in there. The two screws have worn the holes out so we can't use those, I'll put a new one in there. And the back corner here is just a little bit high. So what I'll do is get this corner around here stabilized with a screw up in here bit of weld in here and I can just tap that inside edge down there maybe get a clamp in the corner to pull that in a little bit more but that'll move enough. The factory put a piece of MIG weld across the end here and a piece of MIG weld where it ran across there you can see the edge of it there so now we'll just MIG weld this across here where the rusted out piece is and that'll stabilize that edge. So new screw got one somewhere Just lever that forward a little bit in there. little screws might have done their last drills.
Now I can easily do a big weld in this corner because that's where the factory put their weld and they designed the car to be welded in this manner. So we've got this little recess pressed in here for the lead seam to go into and that creates a lot of strength in that corner. We've also got the recess coming down off the outer skin that fits in there as well. So nothing's going to go anywhere. I'll let that cool a bit though because these welds here were all spot welds. So if I add the heat of this into the heat of welding these ones here, I'm running the risk of causing problems. Now, the only other thing we've got to look at now is the distance that our gutter is in and out. And so we come back down to the measurement and we'll clamp that in place and we'll get a bit of weld in this back corner to hold the back corner where we want because as you see, it moves in and out a fair bit. Well, it's got that set in place. I'll get a spot of weld up underneath and then I can weld this corner in the back here. Okay. Now this roof had a big bulge in here where the rust had pushed it up underneath it. So now we've got a little bit of stretched metal in there to shrink back down and I've just dropped it in this little area here by hammering it there. So I'll, I'll slide a screwdriver or something under there and see if we can just shrink that little bit of a divot out of it. Because I believe it's possible. Let's go. 80% of it out. I've still got a low spot in here, but the screwdriver's not doing it. Like a bent tool would work better. I'll just have a look and see what I've got. I might be able to find something that will do that for us. We'll try this. It's a tire lever for a push bike. That's pretty good. It's a little bit more. And by putting the lever where the low spot is and then hammering around it, we're actually shrinking this little low spot up because there's too much metal there. It's bulged inwards. It's the same as the thing being bulged out. It's just the other way around. So but the jarring motion is what shifts the molecules in the metal to actually get them closer together and packed up to make it less area. So that is pretty good. I think that's about as good as I'm going to worry about. Now, the lead runs in across here, and this area here is leaded across that gap. So that's got those two panels lined up, and I can just weld through there. Now, because the piece of metal's rusted away, I'm just going to build that with the welder. So I've got a good size gap there, but it doesn't actually matter, it's um, just a matter of filling it. If your welding wasn't that good, you could actually just weld a little piece of metal across there and then weld it on the bottom of it, take it back to how it was originally, but I can't see any real benefit in that. Just keeping an eye on it, this is this thin piece of metal that was rusted and I don't want it to sort of get a bit of heat into it and then bulge out and then I'm going to have a problem later on. It looks good at the moment. 
that's probably about as far as I want to push it for now. I'll let that cool down. Still got this back corner to deal with in here. It wants to come down just a little bit. So we've got this corner flows across there nicely. There's no lump on the back here. And because there's a bit of a gap there, I will let that cool a little bit because once again, the strength of the weld will shrink it in there. But what I've done is I've made, I like to call them piers, like a little pier across the gap and I've spaced them across there so they'll hold the gap open when I run a hot weld between them. And I did that by a few little zaps to actually build a little bit of metal there to bridge the gap. And um, once again, depending on the size of the gap, it's to have close you together you put them and how much heat you can pump into it actually building them. But for this repair here, that's worked out quite nice there. I can do that while I'm waiting for this other side to cool down. So that's come back in. I can get a bit more weld in this top corner up here now. And just a matter of working my way backwards and forwards around it to keep busy and we can get it done. So that's coming up nicely. We've got this side of the car quite stable now. Just got this little area a little bit too hot and we're going into that thin piece where there was a few pits and things like that left in it before. So I have to let that cool down before I can go any further. But there's no reason why I can't address the front while I'm waiting for the back to cool down. And that's lined up pretty well, so I can work my way across that easily. Just a balancing act, working from one spot to another. If I ever wanted to restore this car back concourse original, it's no drama to cut this corner out in the future and return it back to the original style. But like I say, mine's just gonna be a little bit unique and um, I've added the sedan corner into it. And it looks a bit like a Monaro as well. Makes it more sporty. Nearly done. Just going to get this side sitting in a little bit better and weld these corners in place. And I've got to weld this through here. And because this is our new metal, I'll be drilling holes and plugging the holes. Now, on the other side of the car, and when I took this apart as well, it was obvious that Holden put a lot of emphasis on welding this. They put welds side by side in a staggered pattern all the way down. Now, when the car was designed, the engineers actually thought it through and looked at the situation and said, this is an area that needs a lot of strength. So as restorers and as repairers, we've got to look at all these things when we take a car apart. If the factory put a lot of weld in an area, it's there for a good reason. We've got to go back and do the same thing. So there's gonna be a bit of drilling and welding there. The important things are to make sure our corners line up, which this one here is here at the moment. And I've got to tap this down a little bit once I've got the corner tacked. I've got to tap a little bit in line inside the window gap there once I've got the corner tacked in place. And this front edge here, I can weld that. That's a MIG weld, the same as what the factory had. But I'll probably run another tech screw in just to hold that down so it's a nice tight fit. And I've just checked my gutter and I'm out by less than a millimetre. It's a little bit too far out on the car. So I'll give that a little bit of a tap and just see if I can push that in a little bit further and get it a bit more snug before I weld things in place. And the front's pretty much there. A little bit of tapping and just weld that across there. So this side's going to be pretty easy. We'll get all this done and then we can look at what we're going to do with this new piece of gutter area here. Right. 
And that's brought it home. I can hear it hit the solid piece of car behind it. So that's all fine. So we know that's in the right spot. And that piece there's come in with it, so it's touching. I can put a bit of weld on that. There's no dramas with that. And that corner, and we'll start gluing it all together. Now a good trick with this with an overlap is if you've got it sitting fairly close, you can put one decent tack on there and then hammer it either side of that. And that'll just stop the metal springing up and down with the hammer blows and get it to sit in there nice and snug. Now a little bit of spitting there in the weld and that was just burning the bit of paint out the way and that's not affecting the quality of the weld at all so I'm not worried at all by that. I've just got plenty of paint on there. I did probably three coats and probably only needed two. Bit of metal stuck in my shield and shorted it out on the welder then. So. Grab a pair of side cutters and hook that out of it. It's got him out. good thing to remember when you're working from an edge with a weld like either side of this gutter it's always good to work in from the edge rather than out to the edge quite often what will happen with thin material if you weld from the middle of the gutter out to the edge you'd have your weld at the hottest point when you get to the end and quite often you'll find that the metal will just want to fall in on itself and you lose it and you have this big hole in the top so something like this I've put a nice big tack on there and just joined that top together and now I can run a vertical weld from the bottom right up to the top and I've got no risk of the gutter actually just melting away and disappearing in front of my eyes. Quite often when you weld a gutter you'll have some trouble with a bit of spitting and carrying on because there's always seam sealant behind it and even though we've sandblasted this there'll still be traces hiding in there and once they superheat from the weld they will want to spit out at you but normally they burn away as you're going so they tend to not be a real problem for the weld unless you've got heaps of it there naturally um, so it'll just burn out zap it a couple more times and normally the holes will fill in there as you go hungry. Let's get enthusiastic and drill all the way through. That should do it. Now same deal as usual, just do a few welds and let it cool down and come back and do a few more. I've taken the vice grip off here just mainly for a camera angle. Normally I would just leave that on there until I got all this welded but let you guys see a little bit better. And um, what's going to actually happen here is we'll cut this back so that we just wind up with two little pieces poking out of the roof about halfway out in the width of the gutter and then we'll weld that facing straight in on the end, glue it all together and then grind it top and bottom and along the end so we've just got a solid piece of metal there and then we're ready to attach our gutter. 
Now just looking at it, I can see that we're a little bit out of alignment on the bottom, so I can hammer that up. That's tidied that up a little bit, but most of this will get trimmed away in a bit once we've got this glued together. Just pumped a heap of weld into the corner and blew a big hole into it. And it was good steel too. It was the metal I've put in there. So it was just a case of being a bit too hot and a bit too hungry. And we've also got that little cutting wheel gap there too. So whenever you've got a gap, you've got to slow down a bit and take it easy. So not listening to my own rules. And it happens. So I just sat there and zap, zap, zap to fill it in and it's done. So never panic if you blow a hole, it's not that big a deal. A little bit of lead contamination in the weld there. Yeah, you can be as careful as you want with getting it out, cleaning it all up with a wire brush while you've got a bit of heat on there. But if you go to weld back over and you hit a bit of lead, well, it's gonna spit and carry on at you, that's for sure. But I've got 99% of it out the way. I'm only welding over a little film of it. If you do hit deep lead with your weld, just knock off because the fumes are toxic. We don't wanna be breathing those in and then come back and melt the lead away and then clean it up with a wire brush. In this situation where I'm putting this add-in piece into the car and it's running into the lead seam, not super critical that I weld that little piece in there. It's only a finished thing. We could tap it down in there. We could get a few spots to stabilize it so it wouldn't move and crack the lead in the future. And then we could lead it all over again and that would work as well because the lead would flow in there and seal the joint up. And it's just the same as soldering two pieces of metal together. But you certainly can't do it anywhere structural, but it'd be just something you'd do as you're filling in the lead seam back in there and bringing it back to look like factory. Where is the lead? Just in here, the white coming out. Same thing there with the gap in the roof. Made a little hole, but it's just a start and stop. And then don't let the weld cool down. While the puddle's still red hot, bring your other little bite back into it so that you're actually building a continuous weld. And we need it gas tight and water tight. We don't actually want pinholes in it and things like that. But that's made a continuous weld, even though I was stopping at the weld and starting it again, just because I was hitting it back into that red hot puddle. So I'll let that cool. I've got to get right down in the gutter line and get some weld in there because we don't want little spots in there where moisture can creep into the car. And I'll weld that from the bottom as well. And we should be able to get a bit more back on the back. Just run some extra metal down this front edge here ahead of my weld and it's like when I grind it I can get a nice sweeping radius off my new piece of roof and onto the original pillar. And I've also welded it pretty hot and pretty slow because the pillar's thick it needs more heat going into it to get a decent weld and also where this flange is there's already three layers of steel and we're welding our new piece on top of that so I've gone same thing there. Heap of weld, gone slow, beat the heat up in there could have even cranked the welder up a bit hotter. I was just a little bit lazy, I, I did it with what I had. Now that's done a nice join. 
but you've just got to be conscious of that. Now the most important thing is where you are welding a thin piece of metal to a thick piece of metal, it comes down to the angle that you're approaching it at. So I have welded with my most of my heat being pumped into the thick piece of metal. So I've got the torch angled so that I'm actually welding beside the join. And what I'm doing is letting enough metal land on there and flow onto the thin piece of metal so that I'm not actually hitting it with the full front of the weld. I'm just letting it spread out and pick this edge up and weld to it as I go. And that's the trick. If you put this down and tried welding it as you would welding two little bits of thin metal together, you'd wind up with a cold weld because the thick piece would suck all the heat away from it. So pump the heat into the thick piece, let your weld flow on and it'll melt onto your piece of steel and it'll attach it perfectly. And it's just a little bit of a trick that you need to practice and get the hang of. But once you've got it, it's there forever. It'll just happen automatically every time you come up to a thing like that. So that's got that corner pretty much where we're at and we'll get the back one finished and we'll start moving on with some of the other stuff. got our corners all welded together so they're ready to grind. I'll get this section in here welded on and then we'll start tackling that little recess in the bottom there which really is easy because it's not going to be many welds on this side because we're going to go roughly 50 mil or two inches apart. So one there, one there, one there, two more of them see so half a dozen welds or so in there, probably eight on the other side and we've got that welded on and then it's just going to be a butt weld for this little section in here where I split the piece of metal. So. That's pretty easy as well, but I will put my welding jacket on to get underneath that to do a weld of that caliber. And I will put two gloves on because the last thing we want is a weld rolling down the palm of our hand. And um, believe me, it happens. Okay, so I'll trim that back, weld that along there, and then we can start looking at the under the gutter part. Nearly done. Now that's our two pieces of metal at the same length poking straight out together and I'll just put the clamp on it so it's not going to spread as I weld it but I'll just do a little section at a time and get the weld all the way along there and that's basically the basis for our gutter to go on. Now I have used this method to repair gutter lines on truck cabs where I've done the full perimeter of the roof the same way, section at a time, stop the roof skin falling down. Holden panel vans where they rust out along the sides, same deal, and even Holden sedans and now utes in the same method. So it is doable and it's not unusual for like truck cab situations where the gutter line is rusted away and it's rusted the whole side of the roof off and there's just holes all the way along here. And the same thing, cut a section out, repair the rail underneath it, make that little backing piece for the gutter, weld it onto the cab and then make your outside piece of skin, weld it on there, and then attach it to the bottom piece along this edge. So it's just, it is tedious, it is time consuming, but anything to do with gutters and getting them right will take you some time. But in the grand scheme of things, if you've got a collector car like this and you're putting some effort into it, it's gonna be well worth it in the end. It's also important to weld the end because if you leave it open originally this was a stitch weld so it sealed the two pieces of metal together all the way along. If we left the end without a weld on there, a bit of moisture there, capillary action would suck it through inside the roof and with defeating the purpose of replacing all this metal we'd be back to square one again. So they look pretty good, there's no real gaps in there so now I can just start welding onto my tacks and building a weld up.
Got a little bit of paint burning in there that's causing the problem. Now, as much as we need weld through primers in there to stop the rust, it can cause some little issues with your welding like that, but perseverance, you'll get there. Same thing, weld a bit, wait a bit for it to cool down, weld a bit more. Now, in this situation, it does not matter at all if suddenly you have a spot want to just collapse around you and leave a bit of a hole in it because if you fill it back in with MIG weld, you've just got a solid weld in there and it's brought the weld back in closer to the roof line anyway, so it's actually better. So once again, don't panic about little things like that. I was a little bit heavy handed on my uh, weld through primer, so not the prettiest weld I've done, but it'll be functional, it'll do the job. So a couple of little pinholes here, I'll just spot those up and then we can let it cool down and I can grind it up and get it ready for the next step. Good enough. Okay, now we're gonna start looking at our piece of weld along the top here. So this piece in here is just a plain butt weld, but I've got to take it very slowly because of the gap, and it'll drag that gutter line in if I sit there and get it too hot. So it's gonna be a case of attack here, attack there, attack there, let that cool down, tacks in between them until I can build little bridges, like little piers, to hold that gap apart and make it stable enough that I can get some weld in there. And probably just half an inch weld at a time, now, it's going to be painful and slow, but well worth it when it's done because it's, like I say, it's the last piece of putting the roof on. We might as well get it right now. This piece back here is where we're going to be doing our big spots in there. So this little recess right up the top is where Holden put their bead of seam sealer all the way along from factory. So by putting our welds right up high in there, we can put our seam sealer over the top and it'll be completely invisible and it'll just look like the factory put the roof on. And that's the whole idea, it's what we've been aiming for. So we'll get in there and we'll weld some of that on there now and get that finished up. And then once that's done, we'll give you another good look at it and we'll just see what I've been talking about. Just welded our new piece of gutter to the original piece of gutter so that's lined up through there and now I'll get my little spot welds on all the way through there and that'll get that part of the job done. Our little fill, our little piers that I've made to join that on there without sucking that in. So I'm actually going to run and put a tack between each of those to get them nice and close together before I start welding that. And these are my nice big spot welds. I've sat there and pumped a bit of heat in there and got a nice big weld in there. And what I'll do is I'll grind the tops of them right off. And these ones in here I'll grind them in so they actually follow the original line of the steel and then make it look like they've just flush in there. And then once I put a bead of urethane all the way through here and smooth it, it'll become invisible. And that's how you put those back together. So that's got our roof glued on on the sides. I've just got the other side to do the underneath like I'm doing here. I'll finish all this in here 
and I'll weld these flanges back together and when we come back next time we can actually put a bit of effort into talking about gutters we'll make a piece and actually attach it in the video and I'll show you a couple of options I've got a bit of tooling that I've made over the years that'll do it in a little bit different way and we can talk about what are good sources for second-hand gutters there's a few cars out there that you might not be aware of that are dead and derelict now that you can salvage gutter from that will work on these cars and there's also a few other ways that we can do it and how I've done it in the past as well before I had equipment that could do it and if you're lucky enough to have a bead roller I'll show you a trick with one of those that you can make your own gutter on that so I'm Rob Teal guys thanks very much for watching we'll catch you next time Trouble from the camera lady. Whoa, that Rob Teeley will be in trouble. Didn't do that elegantly, did I? It lacked elegance. Okay, that's enough.